I was so excited about that last verse. There's a word that will fell him. I started singing it early. Had a little solo there between verses. We need to get to that word that will fell the enemy. We need this song this morning. Open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 9. We really needed to sing Mighty Fortress. I'm going to begin this morning by reading this text, and then we'll pray, and then we'll, with trepidation, look at it together. Revelation chapter 9 and verse 1. Then the fifth angel sounded. Then I saw a star from heaven which had fallen to the earth, and the key of the pit of the abyss was given to him. And he opened the pit of the abyss, and smoke went up out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke came locusts upon the earth, and power was given them, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And they were told not to hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree, but only the men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not permitted to kill anyone, but to torment for five months. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings a man. And in those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, and death flees from them. And the appearance of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle. And on their heads appeared to be crowns like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. And they had hair like the hair of women, and their teeth were like the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates like breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots, of many horses running to battle. And they have tails like scorpions and stings. And in their tails is their power to hurt men for five months. They have as king over them the angel of the abyss. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in the Greek he has the name Apollyon. One woe is past. Behold, two woes are still coming after these things. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to this, your word, and we tremble. We tremble before you as the creator of all things out of nothing. We tremble before you as the great judge of all mankind. We tremble before you as the revealer of hearts and the writer of the future. We tremble before you this morning as we look to these judgments you will bring on those who dwell on the earth. I pray, God, this morning that you would cause people to flee the wrath to come and to find safety in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that you would wrench from us wrong thinking, temporal mindedness, idolatries, sorceries, immoralities, and wickedness. Would you set our hearts on the things which please you, and that we might be useful in this world, and that you might be pleased by our lives. We pray that this text would help us to all these things and more that you intend. By the power of your Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. This chapter is crazy. And I don't mean that irreverently. I mean it depicts a reality that humanity has never seen before. It goes way beyond our experiences. I mean, what does it mean that a shaft will open in the earth and a smoking pit will release hordes of flying locust demons to torment humans for five months? What does this mean? And those who have read the book of Revelation and studied it and written about it have, have given us many ideas of what this could possibly mean. One has said this is just the, the idea of evil. Some have said this predicted the Islamic invasion of Europe. Others have said this is a prophetic description of future military tech in some end times conflict. And I quote, helicopter gunships spraying Agent Orange from their tails. Some have said this depicts the backsliding of the church. 
Some have said this depicts the growth of false religions. Protestants said it is the Pope, and Catholics said it was Martin Luther. What does it mean that a shaft will open on the earth and a smoking pit will release hordes of flying locust demons to torment humans for four months? I would suggest to you that it means that a shaft will open on the earth and a smoking pit will release hordes of flying locust demons to torment humans for five months. These are real events. This is real, literal history for mankind on the earth in the future. These will be real events as they are written. And the fact that we have never seen anything like this does not make it untrue. In fact, that is the point. This will be unprecedented, terrifying, and incomparably bad. Why do we need the details of these judgments narrated for us? Why are we preaching through the book of Revelation verse by verse? The Bible could simply have said, you know, at the end of man's days on earth, it will get bad and God will bring judgments, period, full stop. If that were the totality of this section of Scripture, and if we were preaching God's Word verse by verse, we we would come to that one verse that says that and we would move on. And and maybe you were sick that week or, or you were on vacation and you missed that sermon. The reality is we are meant to sit here for a long time, to contemplate the awful reality of these judgments that come. This is God's intention. The Word of God meets God's intention for it, and and so we read on and on and on in detailed fashion how these judgments will unfold. And maybe you felt like me at times, can't we move on? Can't we just sort of fast forward? We as a church need to soak in the details that God has revealed about the destiny of humanity on the earth, scene after dire scene. These scenes are meant to leave an indelible impression on the heart. We need to allow them to do that. This edge of the Holy Spirit's two-edged sword is designed by God to penetrate the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It is a surgeon's scalpel to remove tumorous idols. It is a father's care to help us loosen our grip on things that are harmful. It is the tender compassion of a mother giving comfort amidst difficulty. It is a prophet's warning to flee the coming wrath. It is a savior's invitation to have peace with God and to find forgiveness of sins at the cross. Forgiveness of the very sins that provoke this wrath to come. Should you be frightened into repentance by reading the book of Revelation? Yes. Should you be wooed by God's kindness and love into the gospel? Yes. This morning we look at the fifth trumpet. What is it about? The fifth trumpet judgment will unleash upon humanity a terrifying horde of demon locusts. That's the point of this passage. We have an unusual outline for you this morning. I'll put the whole outline for you up front on the screen. Normally, a sermon outline is driven by the grammar of a passage. And and if you're in the trust this year, you're working on the diagram and you're trying to make the sentence diagram of your passage emerge into a sermon outline. And that is the normal course of things here on Sunday mornings. This morning's a bit of an exception And it's an exception in part because the the grammar and structure of Revelation 9, 1 to 12 is so simple and so straightforward and so inarguably clear that it's not complicated to follow. In fact, we'll we'll outline the text simply in, in these two parts, the mission of the demon locusts and the description of the demon locusts. And and I'm not content this morning pastorally for that to be the totality of our outline, though it is the outline of the passage. So this morning our outline is, number one, to follow the outline of the passage. But number two this morning, we're going to back up and get a biblical theology of what's going on here. This is such an unusual scene involving things we don't normally make a part of our morning devotions. 
what do demons do? What are they like? How are they structured? What is that abyss? What are they doing there? And what are they going to do in the future? And I think we need to see a little bit more of the Bible's picture on this to understand this scene. So we're going to zoom out. And then thirdly, a third portion of your outline this morning is just we're going to take a little extra time to meditate on what this means for us, how this should address us. Whether you're a believer here this morning and you're listening or whether you're an unbeliever this morning. So that's where we're going sort of as a roadmap. Let's look first at the outline of the text. Again, in two parts, the mission of the demon locusts in the first six verses and the description of the demon locusts in the last. Look down at verse 1. The fifth angel sounded, then I saw a star from heaven which had fallen to the earth, and the key of the pit of the abyss was given to him. This is the fifth trumpet judgment in a series of seven, and it is the first woe. You may remember from weeks prior that the last three trumpet judgments are called woes, as in, woe to you. This is woe number one. And we read here, a star from heaven. This is not an inanimate space object like the star we encountered in chapter 8, verse 10. Uh, That was something like we would call a falling star. Um, a rock or a meteor uh, tracing its way across the the atmosphere of the earth, breaking up, and it embitters all the waters uh, in that judgment. Uh, This actually is a person. This is not a, a rock, a meteor, a comet. This is a being. Specifically, this is an angel. Angels are often called stars, not only in this book, but throughout the Scriptures. And we know this is a person and an angel because this angel takes a key and opens an abyss. That is not the task of a comet or a meteor. And this angel is not Satan. It might kind of sound like Satan if you find a star falling to the earth. You think of the fall of Satan. But Satan is not introduced in the book of Revelation until chapter 12, and he does different things. In fact, the word fallen here can be a little misleading. It it can make us think about a moral fall, but here the word just means a descent, the coming down from a high place to a lower place. It just came down, like the falling star in chapter 8. It just came down. It's not a moral failure. I believe this is a good angel commissioned by God to initiate this first woe, this fifth trumpet judgment. And if you turn to Revelation chapter 20, you see an interesting parallel to this. At the end of the tribulation, when Jesus comes down to the earth and and He is going to begin His thousand-year reign on the earth, an angel from heaven, a good angel, takes care of some business. Look at verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven. Same kind of scene here. Having the key of the abyss, same key, same hole in the ground and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. So just a few chapters later, you have an angel coming down from heaven with that key to the abyss, and he throws Satan in and locks him up for a thousand years. I believe we had good reason here in this chapter to see an angel enacting this judgment. And he goes to the pit The pit here is probably something like a shaft or an opening that leads to a great cavern, and it is called an abyss. Uh, Abyss is a a word that literally means without depth. It's the word for depth with the negative on the front of it, no depth. It doesn't mean it's shallow. It means there's no bottom. This is an immeasurably deep abyss. Look at verse 2. He opened the pit of the abyss, and smoke went up out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke of the pit. This pit is a place of fire emanating smoke to darken the sky. Imagine being on the earth at this time. Your home is destroyed, your white picket fence and all your dreams are demolished. Your future plans have been arrested. Your 401k is worthless. A third of the earth is scorched, deforested, polluted, and contaminated. Some of your family is dead. No one has friends anymore. You can hardly find drinkable water. The earth is ruined. The world is in shambles. The sun, moon, and stars are no longer reliable to give light and warmth to the earth. And now what? Now you're telling me there's a a shaft opening in the ground that leads to some bottomless pit and smoke is coming out and it's darkening the sky? What does this mean? 
What's next? Look at verse 3. Then out of the smoke came locusts upon the earth, and power was given them as scorpions of the earth have power. And you go, locusts. Why did it have to be locusts? One of the most devastating natural occurrences in human experience. A locust swarm presents an uncountable number of voracious insects that descend on every square inch of land and devour everything green. They can take crops for thousands of square miles down to a nub in the dirt, decimating economies, causing widespread famine. And the terror... I've read accounts of those who experienced large locust swarms. It's terrifying. The sound, the, this great cloud of, of insects blotting out the light of the sun, and they descend on everything, on everyone. And listen, as far as insects go, locusts fall into the technical category of icky <laughs> and devastating. They don't bite, they don't sting. They're like grasshoppers. But what would it be like to, to have a sky full of grasshoppers that blot out the sun, land on you and everything around you? They just crawl and fly and eat grass and they eat leaves. They cause no harm to humans directly. They, they harm humans indirectly by destroying crops. But these are not natural locusts. They are given, that passive verb there means God is in charge of all of this. They are given power as scorpions. And there's a clue here that these are supernatural beings, in fact, demonic beings. Notice the way scorpions are described uh, in verse 3. Scorpions of the earth, earthly, worldly, natural arachnids. These are unnatural. They are not of the earth. Look at their description in verse 4, or their mission. They were told not to hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree, but only the men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. These locusts don't eat grass. They don't eat leaves. They don't eat crops. This is very strange. They don't seem to eat anything at all. They just attack people. And they discriminate. They don't attack the 144,000 sealed back in chapter 7, verses 3 and 4. These locusts come out of the abyss. They're not hatched in larval form in the ground. They, they come from under the earth, and they sting like scorpions. They hurt people, only particular people. They don't eat, and according to verse 11, they have a king who is an angel who has a name. We'll get there in a moment. Listen to Proverbs 30, 27, interesting verse on locusts. It says, locusts have no king, yet they go out in ranks. It's an observation about the normal way locusts act. These are not normal. These locusts have wicked intent, though they are limited by God. Look at verse 5. They were not permitted to kill anyone, but to torment for five months, and their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings a man. This is a judgment of God. It's like the eighth plague on Egypt, and it is a fulfillment of the prophecies of the prophet Joel. This is a supernatural swarm of locust demons let loose from a subterranean dungeon called the abyss, and they are released by God to inflict harm on the population of earth dwellers as judgment. It's clear that God is in charge. They are not permitted to kill anyone. Their time is limited to five months. Think about five months for a moment. Five months ago today was September 10th, 2023. A lot's happened since then. Could you imagine enduring five months of this? These demon locusts are malevolent, and their mission is to harm humanity, but they are limited under the sovereign hand of God. And listen, Satan and his demons and cataclysms and catastrophes and every form of evil are all on a short leash. They cannot go farther than God permits. With all of their evil intent, God is sovereign. He's sovereign here. 
Look at verse 6. In those days, men will seek death and will never find it. They will long to die and death flees from them. In those days is a reference to these five months and people will not be allowed to die. They will experience a suffering worse than death. They will experience horrors like the world has never seen, excruciating pain, paralyzing fear, and men will prefer death to their present agony. But think about that. The men who would rather die than repent do not know what is through that door. They do not understand what's on the other side. In this judgment, they will not be allowed to take their own lives. Every attempt at suicide will fail miraculously. And the text tells us that death will run away from them. The word for flee is the word for fugitive. Death will run away from them. Listen, this five-month plague is a preview of hell of the lake of fire, of the eternal state for all those who die in unbelief. Unending torment, but no ability to escape. No annihilation, no going out of existence, no relief. Listen, for a believer to depart and be with Christ, Paul says, very much better. Being with Christ, Christian, is better than your best experiences on earth in this life. To depart and be with Christ means the end of sorrows and the end of pain and the end of sin. But for the unrepentant, to depart without Christ means merely the beginning of sorrows, the beginnings of torment, and an endless sinfulness. There's no repentance in hell. There's no godly sorrow in hell. There's no Holy Spirit produced remorse in hell. There is only the Judas Iscariot kind of angry remorse that rails against God in bitter unrepentance. These earth dwellers may want the demon locust plague to stop, but they won't repent. They'd rather die than turn to God. And this plague is a judgment of God and a revealer of hearts. As you think about it, as you put yourself in their shoes, as you contemplate this horrific reality, what is revealed in your heart? Anger at God? Displeasure with the way He's going to wrap up history? Your fist in God's face? Or will you yield... Will you yield to His goodness and love and kindness to rescue from what you deserve? Secondly, let's look at the description of these demon locusts, beginning in verse 7. These locust demons are super monsters. They are horrors, the likes of which no movie can portray. They are supernatural fiends, otherworldly villains, swarming on humans all over the world. For humanity, there will be no defense and no escape. Look at verse 7. The appearance of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle. And on their heads appeared to be crowns like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. Ten times in this section, we will see words like like and as and appearance like. And so all of these depictions are, are similes trying to capture the physical appearance of these creatures. In verse 7, we discover they are like war horses, and they have something on their heads resembling a crown. That is the word for a victor's crown, not a royalty crown. That is, they go out conquering, and they're undefeatable. And they have something like human faces portraying some level of intelligence. Look at verse 8. They had hair like the hair of women, and their teeth were like the teeth of lions. Uh, Long, flowing hair. Uh, This would be a striking image. And and teeth like lions, although they're not eating anything. Verse 9, they had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. They have chests like iron plates. 
This is a picture of their invincibility. There are no human weapons that can take them down. And the sound would be like multi-horse chariots rushing to the scene of battle. This would be terrifying. Look at verse 10. They have tails like scorpions and stings, and in their tails is their power to hurt men for five months. How do they bring five months of torment? With a physical tail that inflicts physical pain on those dwelling on the earth. Can you imagine it? This puts all of my worst fears together. I, I don't like being stung. I've been stung many times. I, I just hate it. I'm afraid of it. I particularly don't like flying, stinging insects. And if you've been around me at those critical moments, you have been embarrassed of me, frankly. <laughs> we can take some comforts with stinging insects. Scorpions don't live in Minnesota. You could move if you wanted to. Bullet ants, the most painful stinging insect on the earth, don't have wings, so you could get off the ground and leave. The tarantula hawk, that's the pepsis wasp, native here to Arizona. It's about that big, has a blue body with big orange wings, and it sounds like a small helicopter. And, and the way they survive is the, the mother pepsis wasp hunts down a tarantula, a hand-sized spider, gets in a mortal combat with it, stings it, kills it, and drags the carcass back to her hole, her home in the ground, and the paralyzed spider becomes food for her pupating descendants. But the great thing about tarantula hawks, although they're the second most painful insect sting on the planet, and though they live here, they don't swarm. They are solitary beings. Perhaps you've heard of the murder hornets invading the northwest of the United States. Thankfully, they're only in Seattle. <laughs> but you can trap and kill murder hornets. These are all remedies for my worst fears. I have invested in cans of that knockdown spray that kills wasps and hornets and bees on contact. I love that stuff. But there is no remedy for an army of supernatural, invincible, intelligent, armored, lion-fanged, flying warhorse, scorpion, locust demons that descend on every spot on the earth to inflict humanity with unspeakable pain. No weapons, no escape, no remedy. Students of this book of Revelation have debated for years the significance of all of these details. And listen, when this goes down, nobody's going to be debating the finer points of these descriptions. Why do they have long flowing hair? No, everybody will run and hide and scream and weep and tremble and wish they were dead. Look at verse 11. They have as king over them the angel of the abyss. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in the Greek he has the name Apollyon. Both the Hebrew and the Greek, perhaps to get the totality of humanity, Jew and Gentile audiences alike need to know this one is called the destroyer. He is the head honcho over the demons in the abyss, and he leads them out as an army to inflict pain on humanity. What do we learn here? We learn something about the hierarchy in the demonic world. This destroyer is subordinate to Satan, and yet he is king over demons in the abyss. Because this scene is so far out of our normal experience, and perhaps because it has not been the subject of your regular devotional reading of the Bible, I think it will be helpful this morning to zoom out a little bit to what the rest of the Bible says about demons and the abyss and how this relates to humanity's future. So let's look, our second major outline point in the sermon this morning, at the backdrop of the Bible. The biblical backdrop of this coming judgment. 
We often think of Satan as the enemy of humanity. And he is. He's a murderer from the beginning. But he is first the enemy of God. There's a reason he's made himself the enemy of man, because man is made in the image of God, and, and I think he just hates the image bearers. But in another sense, he is also the recruiter of humans in his warfare against God. In his hatred of God and in his hatred of the, the stamp of God on every human being, Satan seems hell-bent on marring that image, corrupting that image, even making that image bearer his slave and an ally against God. I think this is what we see in the opening pages of the Bible. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. Just shortly after the creation of man, you have this enemy on the scene. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which Yahweh God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, you shall not eat from it, you shall not touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, surely you will not die. God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like him. Knowing good and evil. Then the woman saw that the tree was good for food. It was a delight to the eyes. The tree was desirable to make one wise. So she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate, and the eyes of both of them were opened. We have here the fall of man. Paul, commenting on this scene in Romans 5.12, said that death entered. And because death entered through that one sin, now everybody sins. The world has changed. The liar has murdered the race. There were a fixed number of angels made at creation. And there are a fixed number of demons. Demons are created. They are angelic beings who followed Satan in rebellion against God. They are a fixed number. And they are eternal. There will never be more or less demons than were made during creation week. But the human race has unlimited potential. The human race is reproductive. Is it possible that the human race could serve as allies with Satan against God? Now, this is part of Satan's entertaining uh, of this temptation for the woman, you will be as gods. You'll be like God. Sin entered, and now there are partners in cosmic crime. But not friends. Any more than Hitler and Stalin were friends in World War II. In the opening pages of World War II, we might think of, of Russia as an ally to the United States. Not really till the end. Stalin was an ally with Hitler against Britain and against the rest of Europe. And they were allies but not friends. In fact, Stalin only became an ally of the West when Hitler invaded Russia. And Stalin's plans were to invade Germany as soon as he could. And they were both evil, allies, but not friends. And so Satan becomes the enlister, the recruiter of enemies of God amongst the image bearers of God. Listen to Ephesians 2.2. He is called there the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is right now working in the sons of disobedience. And listen to 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. How, how did he do this? How did he accomplish all this? The, the greatest conspiracy theory the world has ever known, the one everybody is in on. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. 
So the backdrop to the scene we're looking at in Revelation 9 is fundamentally Satan's recruitment of humanity at the fall of man and listing them into his services against God for evil throughout human history. But secondly, we see a very particular attempt at this recruitment. We'll call this demonic sin, and the result of that demonic sin is incarceration. And that gives us a very specific backdrop to the abyss. Turn a couple pages to the right to Genesis 6. This is the morning for shocking Bible texts. Now it happened when men began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were good in appearance and they took wives for themselves whomever they chose. And Yahweh said, My spirit will not strive with man forever because he is indeed flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. That's not a reference to how long people live, by the way. That's a reference to how many years before the rain starts falling. Verse 4, The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Yahweh saw the evil of man was great on the earth, that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Look down at verse 8, or verse 7, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, and verse 8, but Noah found favor in the eyes of Yahweh. What's going on in this text? We have several groups of people described here. We have men, and we have daughters born to men, And then we have this other group called the sons of God. The sons of God are not men, by contrast in this verse. What are the sons of God? Uh, This is a phrase used in Job 38, 7 to describe the angels. These are angels. These are not good angels. These are wicked angels. Notice the contrast to the, the way men are described in Genesis 11, 5. Yahweh came down to see the Tower of Babel that the sons of men had built. Human descendants are called sons of men. The angelic beings are called sons of God. The daughters of men are the the human females on the earth. Does this say what it sounds like it says? That demons cohabit with human women and produce a half-breed offspring of supernatural men of renown, beings that are demigods with superpowers, half-demon, half-human. That's what this text says. What is Satan doing here in Genesis 6? I believe he is attempting an interference with the seed line. If you remember Genesis 3, God addressed the snake and said to the snake in Genesis 3.15, the gospel. How did he say it? A woman will bear seed that will crush your head. If you were the snake in that scene, what is your counter move? I got to stop the seed. I got to get in the way of this thing. And so, what does he do right out of the gate? Cain kills Abel. Satan incites murder. We're going to stamp out the seed. And Adam and Eve had other children. And the seed line promise continues. And now in Genesis 6, men have filled the earth. Do you know how many threats to Satan are now filling the earth? Image bearers walking around, one of whom is going to squash his head. What does he do? I can't kill them all. I'll breed them out. I'll bring a corruption into the seed line so that the seed line is part demonic. This is an insidious plot. Again, we're we're dealing with texts, both future and past, that are so outside of our experience, we're tempted to dismiss them. Don't do that so quickly. This is an accurate historical record of a real event in human history. By the way, the Bible is not alone in depicting it. 
The Bible's the only narrative that gets the story accurately, but our world and its cultures are full of the incubus myth. Demons cohabiting with women and producing a half-breed offspring. That, that is essentially the essence of Greek mythology. You have the gods and the demigods, and some of them have relations with humans and produce these heroes. Norse mythology has the same things. Our modern supermans and superheroes, the Marvel comic series and movie universe, all of these things flow from this same idea. Like many events in history that are accurately recorded by the Bible, they are perverted in the oral traditions of the world's cultures, a kind of historical telephone game. You repeat what you heard from somebody else and you get the detail just a little bit off and pass it on and a little bit off and pass it on. But you need to know what the Bible actually says about it. God brought the flood on the earth to wipe away this massive infiltration of the human seed line with demonic offspring. And according to Genesis 6-4, it seems like Satan tried it after the flood also. You see there the Nephilim were on the earth in those days, flood days, and also afterwards, post-flood days. How did they get there? The sons of God came into the daughters of men and produced the mighty men of old. This is where Goliath came from and his kin. The Nephilim, they were there during the conquest in Joshua's day and a handful of their descendants in David's day. What happened to the demons who executed this plan? They were incarcerated, confined in a dungeon until judgment. But we need to turn to the New Testament to get some details. Turn to Jude chapter 6 and 7. It's only one chapter in Jude. Those are verses. Jude is describing false teachers in the church and compares them to the angels, the demons of Noah's day. He says... Angels who did not keep their own domain, but they abandoned their proper abode. God has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. And then he makes a comparison, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they, in the same way as these, in other words, the demons of Noah's day, in the same way as the sinners in Sodom and Gomorrah indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, and they are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Why are there demons in a fiery pit in Revelation chapter 9? Jude tells us because of Genesis 6. Listen to 1 Peter 3, you can turn there, 1 Peter 3, 18 to 20. We get this great statement of the gospel. Listen to these words carefully. 1 Peter 3, 18, For Christ also died for sins once for all time, the just in the place of the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which... He also went and made proclamation. One of the things Jesus did in his spirit after the cross, before the resurrection, was to make proclamation to the spirits now in prison. So they were in prison when Jesus went and made proclamation to them, and they were still in prison when Peter is writing this letter. And then he describes them, verse 20, they once were disobedient. That doesn't mean they've never sinned since then. Just... In this event, in history, they were disobedient. When the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah, during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. We think about the ark as the salvation of eight people. Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their three wives. But it was also the preservation of an uncorrupted seed line 
whereby the woman would bear a seed that crushed the head of the snake. God stamped out all the corruption in the genetic material. 2 Peter 2 verses 4 and 5 gives us another angle on this. In all of these texts, Jude, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, the the authors are speaking about false teachers and making a comparison to the ancient world that people knew about and what God did with the demons. 2 Peter 2.4 says this, If God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment, and He did not spare the ancient world, but He preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others when He brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. In all of these texts, there is a connection to two realities regarding these demons, Noah's era and sexual perversion. Every one of the texts deals with it the same way. In other words, these demons, leaving their proper abode, crossed a line of evil that God would not tolerate and were placed in confinement. Your mind might be wondering about the mechanics of this. How is that possible? I'm not going to lead a discussion on that here. But you might be asking, can it happen now? And it seems to me that it doesn't. That, that whatever God has done with this confinement has disincentivized it or God has said enough and it's not possible. One way or another, this isn't still happening. And we have some window into that in Luke 8. There's a man who is demon-possessed. Luke 8, 28, seeing Jesus, he cried out and fell before him, said in a loud voice, what business do we have with each other, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. That's not the man speaking. Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for it had seized him many times. He was bound with chains and shackles and kept under guard, and yet he would break those bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered the man. And the demons were imploring Jesus not to command them to go away into the abyss. Do you see it there? Now there was a herd of swine feeding there on the mountain, and the demons implored him to permit them to enter the swine. Again, God's sovereign over all the evil. They have to get permission. And the demons came out of the man, entered the swine. The herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. What does that tell us? The demons know about the abyss. They know that for them it is a place of torment until final judgment. They don't want to go there. Now imagine for a moment that every prison door in our world today just sprung open and all of the worst, most violent criminals were released simultaneously with access to all the resources and all the weapons they want to have allowed to roam free amongst the populace. What terror would this breed on the earth? And yet this fifth trumpet will be far worse when the pit is unleashed. And then the sixth trumpet we'll look at next week, Lord willing. May the Lord come back before then. The sixth trumpet will be far worse. Let's close out our outline this morning by just thinking about the importance of all of this for our lives. Why did God reveal it? Why do we need to know it? Why is it in our Bibles? I'll say, first of all, you need to recognize the two sides in this war. You are on a battlefield. You have been on a battlefield since birth. And there are two sides. God wants us to know about angels and demons. He wants us to know about ranks of angels and ranks of demons. He wants us to know about cosmic warfare. He wants us to know about the malevolent nature of Satan's assistants his armies. God also wants us to know that He is sovereign over evil, that all of it is on a short leash. God also wants us to know that the lake of fire is different from the abyss described in Revelation 9. God wants us to know that there is no neutral ground. 
that there is a fight with principalities and powers, that there is a war that we wage, not with flesh and blood. That battlefield for now is invisible, but it is very real. There is coming a day when it will be very visible and very physical on the earth. So recognize there's a war and there are two sides. Secondly, this morning, you need to rethink your attraction to darkness. You need to rethink your attraction to darkness. And I know it's in there. It's in here. There are times when that which God hates has an attraction for us. And it's true categorically if you're not in Christ. Uh, Unbelievers, according to Jesus' assessment in John 3, love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. If you're a slave of sin, uh, that's what is fun and good and delightful for you. Uh, You don't feel like a slave maybe. You feel like you're just getting what you want and you're living free. The reality is you are in the darkness and opposed to the light. But for all of those who have come to Christ and have been forgiven by the blood of Christ at the cross, you experience the residual effects of the darkness you were born into and saved out of. You have been transferred into the kingdom of light. You are now a citizen of heaven. But as long as you are on this earth, in this body, you still have sin. Not a slave, but sin is present in you at the heart level. And if we're honest with ourselves, we don't say, well, I... I didn't want to sin, but I did. The reality is we did want to sin at some level. That want is in us, not categorically, not your identity, but a present reality. We need to rethink our attractions. When we're attracted to darkness, there is a sense in which we are repulsed by God. Think about magnetic attraction from one pole to another. We're moving from something to something else. And for the world, this darkness looks enticing. Satan is dressed as an angel of light. He is a deceiver. He masquerades in that which looks good. Right? Think about the phrase right now that's popular. Love is love. Well, doesn't that just sound great? It's evil. It's a lie. But Satan dresses himself up in these things which sound good. And the darkness makes promises, doesn't it? The darkness said, "Ah, just give me a little bit. Give me what I want and I'll give you what you want. Listen, you might be here this morning and thinking, I don't want God to tell me what to do. I, I want to be free. I want to live my life my way. I'd rather party with my friends than repent and follow Jesus. You don't want the goodness of Jesus? You don't want life in God? Listen, Revelation 9 is a preview of the team you've selected. You might feel honored that you got picked to play on that team. But you need to know the darkness does not love you. It does not care for you. In fact, during the fifth and sixth trumpets... Uh, The darkness will be released. The earth-dwelling humans who have loved the darkness rather than the light will not be saying, like teammates on a hockey team, hey, the timer's up. My teammates are coming out of the penalty box. Now we have a chance at winning. These aren't friends. These aren't teammates, buddies. In fact, every earth dweller will run and scream and try to hide and wish to die. And if you are attracted to the darkness now, you need to rethink your attraction. And that leads to a third consideration for us. We need to learn to discern the true intentions of the enemy. We need to learn to discern the true intentions of the enemy. What does the enemy want? To kill and to destroy. In the fifth trumpet judgment, it's limited. Uh, The enemies of humanity are only allowed to harm. But in the sixth trumpet judgment, they will be allowed to murder. And you have to break through the deceptions. 
Satan's masquerade as an angel of light. His schemes are cloaked in ideologies and fine-sounding logic, in religious goody-two-shoeism, and pleasure, and fun, and delight, and careless living. Freedom. Promising to give you everything you want. But what is the real intention of the darkness? The darkness wants to use you and then destroy you. Listen, some of the world's worst evil has been locked up for 4,000 years. That evil has been tormented. Those are beings with personalities and names. And they've been tormented under judgment by God for four millennia And some of them will be released soon on the earth. What will they do? Is that going to be a party with long lost buddies? Listen, when the darkness is let out of its cage, you will see it for its true intentions. Torment, misery, pain, terror, despair. And then under the sixth trumpet trumpet judgment, murder. Final consideration for this morning. Trust in God who wins. Applies to everybody listening to me this morning. Trust in God who wins. Where does God win? First of all, at the cross. Listen to Colossians 2.15. He disarmed the rulers and authorities. Those are the two words describing evil spiritual beings. He made a public spectacle of them and triumphed over them through Christ. Secondly, God wins in the church. Listen to Ephesians 3.10. So that the manifold wisdom of God would now be made known through the church to those rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. God is saying something by bringing all of us together in salvation, in Christ, protected from the evil one, in a mockery of those evil powers. Thirdly, God wins in your life. I'm going to read this section on the armor of God from Ephesians chapter 6. You can turn there if you like. Listen to this command followed by this armament. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the powers, the world forces of darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenlies. Therefore, Take up the full armor of God, so that you will be able to resist in the evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit which is the Word of God. It's good encouragement for us in our day. Trust in God who wins. He wins at the cross. He wins in the church. He wins in your life. And finally, He wins for all time. Listen to Revelation 20, verse 10. And the devil who deceived the world was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. That's seen in Revelation 20, verse 10. The great white throne judgment comes after the thousand-year reign of Christ. So what's coming for future human history? Satan unleashes his worst and gets thrown in that abyss for a thousand years and locked up. Comes out for a final rebellion, only to face Jesus on the throne and personally cast into the lake of fire for eternal torment. Jesus called hell, or the lake of fire, the eternal state of unbelief, the place prepared for the devil and his angels. God wins. 
A mighty fortress is our God. A bulwark, never failing. Our helper, he, of mid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still, our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal. Did we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. You ask who that might be? Christ Jesus, it's he. Lord of armies, his name, from age to age the same. He must win the battle. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God has willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word will fell him. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them, abideth. The spirit and the gifts are ours through him who with us sideth. Let goods and kindred go. This mortal life also, the body they may kill. God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. Lord, we praise you, King of all kings, victor, conqueror, our Father. We thank you for these words that give us a glimpse into what is coming. Lord, fix our loyalties and let us trust in you.